Okay. Um, so, as you see here, this is joint work with Nick Ryder. Um, and this will fit pretty nicely in right after Mohan's talk, where he gives this sort of conjecture that would have been really nice if we had had it um, that's false. And you can kind of see the, the content of this talk, and, and this is basically me sort of talking about the content of a particular paper me and Nick wrote. You can basically see it as what we were able to get along the way to trying to formulate and prove that conjecture that ends up being false. Um, so let me just uh, get started having said that. So uh, I'm going to kind of briefly go through these, these couple of examples that you've probably either seen either earlier today or... Uh, you know, at the boot camp or some other time. Um, and there's even other examples that were talked about today that I'm, I'm not going to talk about, but they're all, they all kind of fit in the same category, which you'll see here. So uh, in trying to solve this Kettison Singer problem, uh, Marcus Spielman and Srivastava looked at this uh, mixed characteristic polynomial, right, where you have some characteristic polynomial with some extra variables um, with a bunch of matrices. You apply some differential operator. You plug in a bunch of variables to be zero. There's other formulations of this. Um, but you care about exactly some kind of root bound about this, okay? You want to know how much, how big the largest root can be. Um, and as I mentioned, this, this is sort of the main technical object of study. Uh, if you can get some kind of root bound on this, right, which that's the question. If you can get a root bound, you can use this interlacing families argument to get some root bound for some uh, particular element of some sum. So I haven't written it like this. But you could see this as the expected characteristic polynomial of sums of independent rank 1 PSD matrices, and you want to make some claim about some particular one. Right? So this is this standard existence proof that interlacing families is used for. So you bound the roots of this, you get roots of something you care about, and that's, and that's what you want to do. Uh, very similarly, in this argument about uh, Ramanujan graphs, there's some polynomial like this, some very similar. Th I, I didn't write it quite like uh, like the other one, but I'll, on the next slide you'll see it's just some differential operator applied to some determinant, and you similarly care about, you know, bounding the max root. Okay, so you have uh, some signed adjacency matrices. Uh, you look at their characteristic polynomials, um, and you and you kind of play the same game. Okay, you want to know that you want to be able to bound the roots, and if you can, which they're able to do. Um, then you can get some similar bound for some particular uh, element in this interlacing family. Okay, but this, I'm kind of just watching over this very quickly. This is stuff that's been talked about before. The point is, right, in both of these situations, you can write this polynomial you care about as some determinant uh, with some differential operator applied to it, uh, and then you set some variables to be zero, and you want to bound the roots of this. Same with this second situation. It turns out this is an equivalent formulation. Um, and like I said, this is what you want to do. You have some constant coefficient differential operators applied to some polynomials, and you want to know how the roots move. Okay. So what this talk then is going to be about is it's going to kind of move away from these specific applications, and it's going to ask how can we solve this question in general for particular classes of polynomials. And in particular, we're going to be looking at real stable polynomials. Um, and the idea we had, or the hope was, that we could somehow generalize this barrier method to some big theory, kind of like emulating maybe the borchea branden uh, characterization with some kind of like stronger form that gives you root bounds or something like this, right? That was our goal. Uh, and like I said, the, the sort of at the end, the big conjecture ended up being false, but along the way, there were some pretty interesting things that we, that we figured out. Okay. So uh, in order to do this, we're going to define this object with Mo Mohan already defined. Uh, I might use a slightly different normalization, and I certainly am using a different way to write it than he wrote it. Uh, he wrote it as some expected characteristic polynomial of some matrices. It turns out an equivalent formulation is this. Uh, and what I'm going to, what, what I'm using here is that this partial x to the k is just going to be the derivative with respect to x k times. And the point is somehow you, you are taking like d derivatives and you're putting k of them on p and maybe d, k, d minus k of them on q. Um, this one you happen to be plugging in 0. That one you're plugging in x, so it ends up being this uh, you know, it, it still ends up being a univariate polynomial of the same degree as the original ones. Um, and this is going to be the main operator we're going to look at. Okay. So this is called the uh, finite free convolution or the additive convolution. Um, 
So before, uh, I'll, I'll say why it's called that, but before I, I say that, I just want to point out that if you think about this, any constant coefficient differential operator on polynomials at most degree d can be written somehow like this, as some convolution by a particular polynomial. Okay, so what you can do is if you have your coefficients next to the, next to the derivatives, you just make those coefficients be the coefficients of q, maybe with some you know, uh, factorials or something like this. Okay, and this ends up then, right, whenever you sort of just work this out, this is like the d minus k coefficient of q up to factor times the k derivative of p. So somehow this, this encapsulates all possible constant coefficient differential operators. Okay. okay, so why is it called the finite free convolution? It turns out to be some finite dimensional approximation to the free convolution, free probability theory. Um, I will be honest with you, my, the extent of my intuition uh, about that fact is, is limited. Um, but MSS, uh, Marcus Spielman and Srivastava kind of talk about this in, in one of their papers. And in particular, Adam Marcus has like a pretty extensive paper about the connections and, and what sort of things happen when you limit what you can say, things like this. The thing I'll focus on, on more, which I am much more familiar with, is why it's called the additive convolution. Um, and I, I mean, there's a more general question here, why, why? You know, why do this, right? What's the point? This seems to just make things very confusing. Okay, you, you've taken something that like is maybe pretty straightforward, some differential operator, you've put it in this weird form. Okay, the main reason why you wanna do this is, uh, well, there are a couple reasons. This is maybe the first one. So let's suppose we forget about real coefficients and real rootedness, and we just have some complex univariate polynomials, and we know that their roots lie in some circles, some disks, or like a circular region. So it could be a half plane or an exterior of a disk as well, could, could use for, you could use for these. Well, if you know where those are and you take the additive convolution, uh, then you know that the roots of the convolution uh, are contained in the Minkowski sum of these two disks. So this is a pretty, like, surprising fact. Um, it's not obvious why this should be the case. Uh, and there's probably the best proof of this that I know is using some kind of symbol of polynomials argument, which I, I won't go into, but you can do something like that. The, the, the symbol of things related to this additive convolution is very natural. And so like these types of results you're going to be able to get by doing some kind of symbol. Yeah, does it have to be circular? Or circular? Yes, they, yes, they do. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you may be able to, right, so you can do certain things like, for instance, if P, if P and Q are both real rooted, then I can pick like the closed upper half plane, and then I can pick the closed lower half plane. And so it's going to show that the roots of the additive convolution are going to be in both of those. So it, it implies that it, in fact, preserves real rootedness. So that's one thing you can do. And I imagine there's other things that you can do like this. But at least the sort of the base result is, is this. And the, in, in its like kind of most general form, they have to be circular read. OK. Um, and this is the, the formulation that Mohan gave in the previous talk, which I think uh, he used the unitary group. But I, I, I'm assuming maybe they're real symmetric. I think orthogonal is, is good enough. But there's actually a number of groups that you can put there that you can symmetrize over. Um, but it turns out that this is equal to this expected characteristic polynomial. Um, and as he mentioned, right, by, by uh, sort of averaging over the orthogonal group, you're sort of washing away the eigenvectors, and you're just leaving the eigenvalues. And so it's not too surprising that the thing you get only depends on the eigenvalues of the original matrices. And also, there's kind of another interesting way to write this, which if you, if you don't have matrices, well, I mean, if you don't want to make matrices, if you just have the polynomials and you want to know something in terms of roots, uh, then this is another way you can write it as well, where I've sort of used this shorthand notation. Lambda i means just the i root of p. Lambda sigma i means the sigma i root of q. They can be sort of ordered in any order. This is not really order dependent, um, at least as stated here. But uh, so that's another way to write this. So this is somehow at least natural in, in the way that it can be formulated. There's a lot of nice ways you can write it. Uh, it has this really nice property. Um, and we'll see that it also has a lot of other nice, really prop, good, uh, nice properties on the next slide. Um, so sort of the, the, the main thing that you can get from then Walsh's result about circles uh, is that right once you have sort of real rootedness preserving, using that argument I just gave about using half planes, you can then also do something where you just sort of take the smallest circle centered on the real line containing all the roots. And if you sum those, you're going to see that the the max root of the, of the convolution of the two is going to be contained in sort of the sums of the circles. And so it's going to be bounded by the sum of the max roots of the two underlying polynomials. So 
th there are a lot of ways to prove this. Uh, I think even you can maybe just prove it straight from the, from the uh, expected characteristic polynomial formulation. Uh, but you can also prove it using that circular uh, regions argument. So then some other nice things I'll just say. Uh, it has a lot of nice algebraic properties. It's commutative, which is not obvious, but if you just write down in terms of a basis, you, you can do it that way. Um, there's also a way to write it a little more symmetrically, because you know if you remember the way I wrote it, it had that zero in one input in the Q input and an X in the, in the P input, so it looks maybe a little non-symmetric, but there's a way to make that look more symmetric. You also have associativity, which is pretty straightforward. And you also have a lot of invariance properties, which um, I've written them here, but th probably the words are the better way to think of them. Uh, you can shift in any one input, and the shift pulls out or goes to the other input. You can take derivatives, and those pull out. That's pretty straightforward to see. Uh, and you can also, see, if you scale both inputs, you can sort of pull that scale out here up to a factor. Okay. Um, and if you, if you think about maybe what this scale invariance means, there's another interpretation of this that if you think of the convolution as, and I'll, and I'll talk about this in a minute, a little more detail, but if you think of the convolution as being some, if you look at the input polynomials as being polynomials in X and their roots, so if you just make the roots variables, if you make both input polynomials like that, you take this convolution and now you're going to end up getting something that is a polynomial in X where the roots of it are somehow a function of the roots of the two inputs. Okay? This says something like, if you think of it in this abstract way, this convolution is, is like a homogeneous polynomial. Okay, this is maybe what, what this sort of says. And I'm gonna, I'll, I'll, it's not very hard to see, but I'll write it down on the board here in a minute. It actually turns out to be hyperbolic when you do this. And there's some interesting things you can get from this. So I'll talk about that Excuse me, in a minute. Um, and then the last thing that's really nice about it is it actually completely characterizes which constant coefficient differential operators preserve real rootedness. Um, We've already seen that uh, if P and Q are real rooted, then so is the convolution of P and Q. Um, and it turns out that the polynomial x to the n is, is the identity for this convolution. If one of your inputs is x to the n, you just get out the other one. So as, as soon as that's the case, any, any Q for which convolution by Q is going to preserve real rootedness has to be real rooted itself, because it has to map x to the n to something real rooted. Okay. So this ends up characterizing differential operators, which preserve this property. So again, maybe, maybe another reason why we might look at things in this form, even though it seems a little bit weird uh, at, at, at first, first glance. OK, so you know, we've, we got this triangle inequality. Uh, it gives us some root bounds. And you know, maybe we're done. I mean, maybe all the stuff that, you know, like all these problems we want to solve about Caddis and Singer and all this stuff, I mean, you know, we just need to bounce some root. Maybe this is enough. OK, and, and as you might guess, you know, a result from 1922 is not enough to prove these things. Um, so this, this unfortunately is, is far too weak. And probably the moral reason why it's too weak is the fact that the, one of the ways you can get this is based on circular regions. Somehow the root bounds are not a real st stable or real rooted polynomial fact. It's based more on you can enclose things in some circle in the complex plane. And even if I hadn't had real rootedness, I, I could have get, gotten some similar thing with the triangle inequality. I think you can even bound the, the modulus of the max root by, by, like the modulus of the max root is going to be bounded by the sum of the moduli of the, of the roots of the inputs. So somehow this isn't about real rootedness. And because of that, it can't be really about convexity or, or any of these properties that come with hyperbolic or real stable polynomials. Um, and if you know the proof of, of Caddis and Singer that MSS do, that's a pretty crucial feature. And so, it's not, it's not unexpected that this would not be enough. OK. OK, so the question, of course, then is can we do better? OK, and the first answer to that is there are two possible ways we could do this. OK. One of them is, well, maybe if we knew more information about not just the max root or equivalently the min root, maybe if we knew more information about the interior roots, like the fifth root or something like this, then maybe inductively this might help us to keep track of more information about where these roots are, and we could maybe use that to prove some better bounds or something like this. Okay, that's, that's maybe one idea. The other idea, which is the one that MSS take on um, in their proof, is let's try to get some sharper bounds on the max root, which, which don't have this property of being just generalizable to basically any complex rooted polynomial. Right? Can we take real, real uh, rootedness more into account? 
Um, and the other thing that I, I guess I should say, I, I've kind of gone, gone down this route of univariate polynomials, but I mean, at the end of the day, we really care about multivariate polynomials because, right, we had some multivariate thing, we do some derivatives on it, then we restrict to univariate. So really we care about bounding the roots or, or whatever the, you know, the, the zero region of, of a multivariate polynomial. Um, and it turns out, and of course that's actually what we want to do, uh, it turns out that some univariate result in this category ends up being enough to prove the MSS results. Um, if you're familiar with the argument. I'm, can I ask you? Yes. I'm just a, like, I mean, the softmax in MSS is very much the first, like an item of the first kind, isn't it? Like it's like taking into account all the other roots. Um, it, but I, I would still see it as, and maybe I'm not thinking about what you're talking about. I would still see it as something that is at the end of the day, attempting to bound the max root. It may be taking into account more roots, of, of course, right? That's how you're going to get sharper bounds here. Um, but at the end of the day, their bound is still like on the max root of something, right? So maybe that's all I'm, I'm trying to say. Um, maybe we can also get bounds on not just the max root, um, beyond just taking into account other roots to get a bound on the max root. Maybe we can say something more about that. Um, and then for multivariate, like I said, I mean, this was, and this was kind of our big goal, right? We, we kind of studied all the univariate stuff, hoping that we could then find a really good way to generalize it to multivariate polynomials, which is what we really care about. Uh, and you can define a convolution in a very similar way, which I'll, which I'll show. You get a triangle inequality, and it's too weak, as it is in this case. And, but when we get there, I'll kind of talk about what maybe what we can do, right? Okay, what did we try? What failed? What might still be true? Things like this. Okay, so like I said, the first kind of bullet of that univariate part is talking about roots that are not necessarily the max root, okay? And this is kind of, uh, like I said, uh, this paper is sort of uh, a collection of things we, we found out along the way to failing to prove something, I would say. Um, and so these are going to be kind of a handful of interesting facts about this convolution and conjectures that we kind of think if we had a better handle on, maybe we'd be able to understand how we can improve these bounds that, that MSS get uh, more. Um, so I'm going to kind of, like I said, I'll talk about this. I'll kind of talk about the MSS result. I'll move on to multivariate. And we'll kind of, maybe you can see some connections between all three of those. OK. So what we're going to do here is uh, we're now going to have this univariate polynomial. It's going to be real rooted. Unless I specify otherwise, everything's going to be real rooted from now on. Um, and I'm going to order the roots in non-increasing order, uh, counting multiplicities. And uh, I'm going to define this sort of shorthand for summing over some collection of the ordered roots. Okay, so if I wanted to sum over the top three roots, then my set i would be 1, 2, 3. Okay. And then I would use lambda ip for that. Okay? So the first thing that you can get, which is actually turns out to be not very hard um, once you know a lot of hard results, um, is that you get Horn's inequalities for this. And that basically means that if you have some collection of indices that work for all Hermitian uh, matrices, then it also works for this additive convolution. Okay? So if, uh, I mean, there are, are a number of these uh, inequalities that you can get. So let me just write down some of the classic ones. So the ones I'm most familiar with though again there are many, um, are first of all, well let me just in fact, I think it's written at the bottom of this, I'll just put this up there for... Jonathan? Yes. Can you get this from Dubrovin or Winnick of Helton? Yes, that's exactly, how, I mean, yeah. You, I think, I mean, I think, I, I don't know if you were the first one to do it to basically get, yeah, yeah. used get the root bounds for hyperbolics, yeah. but as soon as you have it for hyperbolics, I'll, I'll show, I mean, yeah. all you have to show is that this is like a hyperbolic polynomial and then you're done, yeah. Okay, so, some examples of this, so for instance, one of them is just, uh, which I've already written, i equals j equals k equals just the set consisting of the number one, so that's just the, the triangle inequality, okay? But it turns out that you can also do i equals j equals k equals one up to some k. And if, if you're familiar with this, this 
this collection of inequalities is equivalent to this majorization relation, okay, which is usually written like this. And again, I mean, one of the many equivalent definitions of majorization is just that, uh, well, it's usually like if you have two uh, real vectors, A and B, we're going to use this notation, A sort of precedes B if um, some i equals 1 to k, a i is less than or equal to sum i equals 1 to k, b i, uh, with quality when k equals d. Okay, and again, the, these are ordered, right? So a1 means like the largest uh, element of, of a, b1 means the largest element of b. Uh, but you can see then how this is exactly what you get in this situation. Over here you have the roots of the convolution, and over here you sort of have the ordered roots of each of the polynomials summed together. So you get some kind of majorization relation like this. Um, it turns out, and I, I'm not going to be able to talk about why you get this, but it's actually a corollary of this fact and, and just a little bit of computation. You also get something of the form uh, this if lambda of p is majorized by lambda of q. So if the roots of p have this property compared to the roots of q, then you can actually convolve by r, and it preserves this property. Okay. This is actually uh, a corollary of a result of Borchea and Branden, which you know many things are in this field. Um, that where they basically show that any linear operator preserving real rootedness preserves this kind of majorization property. But you can also get this from all this hyperbolicity stuff. And let me just make a quick comment about this hyperbolicity, and I, and I will sort of uh, rush through the definition a little bit. If, if you're familiar with it, then you know, you'll, you'll know it. If you're not, um, then we can talk about it after, if you'd like. But basically, the point is, if you look at the polynomial, um, like I said, so let's write this polynomial uh, P X comma A1 through AD, B1 through BD, to be defined as basically this. So essentially, I, I write down the roots as these variables that I'm inputting, and then I sort of take this convolution just in terms of x. Okay. And so out of this, I'm going to get some degree d polynomial in x, where the coefficients depend on the ai's and the bi's. And if you remember from, let's see if I can uh, find this again. If you remember from this formulation, <coughs> this actually demonstrates. That, the, that this will actually be a polynomial in all the ai's, x's, and b's. Right? This just says you're looking at ai is, is maybe the i-th root of p over here. Or sorry, sorry. bi is the i-th root of p, and ai is the i-th root of q. You're just going to do some sum over some product of things like this, and you're going to get some polynomial in x, ai, bi. And the point is that. At the end of the day, saying that this is, so it turns out that this is hyperbolic with respect to the vector 1 and then a bunch of zeros. And roughly speaking, what this means is, right? Um, I mean, or for those of you that are familiar with hyperbolicity, this follows essentially from the fact that this preserves real rootedness. Okay? That's just basically what happens. Okay? Um, and like I said, I, I, I'm just going to leave it at this. If you're interested in what this statement means and you don't know about hypervelocity, uh, you can ask the question at the end and I can talk a little bit more about it. Um, but for those of you that do know what it means, um, this is then precisely what allows you to get this fact. Because essentially, the way you should think about hyperbolic polynomials is sort of generalizing um, the relation of uh, a matrix to its characteristic polynomial, to its eigenvalues. Okay. And so since we know this about Hermitian matrices, there's a way to transfer the, this fact about Hermitian matrices to hyperbolic polynomials. And then once you know it about hyperbolic polynomials, you get it for this particular hyperbolic polynomial. Okay. 
By the way, as was in definition the, in that theorem, when you use permutation, when you add over permutations. Uh, oh, in the in the in that in above. Yeah, yeah. The de the, the definition uh, of. Uh, those permutation polynomials are they interlacing or not? So I think they're not. Yeah, yeah. I, and I and and this is like a this is a, a good question to ask because if they were, this would be some really nice thing that you could do. But I'm I'm pretty sure. Like, did you have an example? No, no, no. Yeah. Uh, we we have an example. Uh, Nick knows an example. I I don't know it off the top of my head. Yeah, I don't think they're interlacing. But you do get the real rootness from them from this monotone permanent. No, no. I just, yeah, yeah. But okay. Okay. No, okay. I don't. I don't. I don't, not, I don't think so. I don't think so. No. Yeah, yeah. No. I also don't know of any way to make an interlacing family out of them. Like maybe we're generating with swaps or something. Yeah, we we tried with swaps. I think even I don't even think that worked. So I, I don't. I don't think so. I don't know. Okay, so this is what we're able to get with interior roots. Uh, you know, once you sort of see this, this is not that uh, not a big deal. I mean, it just basically follows as a corollary from some, from a big theorem. Um, but this, along with this extra fact, um, is what sort of enabled us to to do the next thing, which is to generalize the MSS result about the max root to something more general. And Mohan even touched on this already. So let's just move on to that. Okay, so like I said, we, we were going to talk about what can we do about interior roots. Uh, maybe we can get something uh, better there. And we were, like I said, all this stuff is something better. It might have even been known. I'm not really sure. I, I couldn't find it explicitly stated anywhere. Um, but in any case, this is not hard to prove once you sort of see the pieces. The thing that maybe is hard to prove, uh, even if you have the pieces, is, is this. Um, and this is what MSS sort of is at the heart of their kind of barrier argument in determining how far the barrier can move under certain operations, okay? And the point is, this is some kind of like tweaked triangle inequality, okay? So instead of measuring the max root of the convolution of the two things, you're measuring some sort of like, you know, uh, perturbed maybe uh, polynomial, and then you're sort of measuring the max root there. And the point is, you get something, right, if you maybe perturb in the right way, you can get something maybe a lot stronger because this d alpha makes this bound sort of a lot a lot stronger than just the triangle inequality. Of course, right now you've got these u alpha every, u alphas everywhere, and we've got to sort of figure out you know how are we going to deal with this? What's what you know we have some better bound, but maybe we can't really make use of it. Um, but it turns out to be actually quite work quite well. And in fact, I'll just I'll just make a quick aside here about the uh, about this barrier method. Right, the the barrier method has to do with Trying to bound things of this form, so you're looking at something like dx p over p, and maybe you want to say that at alpha, it is. Make sure I do this right. Um, you want to say that this is greater than or equal to some. Yeah, like one over alpha. Let's say that. Okay. If you rewrite this, what it ends up being is just. Or maybe it's the other way. Am I doing this wrong? Anyway, maybe it's, uh, yeah, I think it's actually this. Right, this ends up, and let's say, well, let's say alpha is some uh, input that's sort of larger than all the roots of the polynomial p. So if you do, if you write down some, some form like this, which is some bound on this potential function that they use for the barrier argument, if you rearrange it, you just get that p minus alpha dx p evaluated at a is greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so some claim about the barrier uh, function is equivalent to saying something about u alpha applied to p. Okay, so that's sort of how you can take statements like this and convert them to say something about the barrier. Okay, so like I said, once you have something like this, um, you get this tighter root bound. Um, and the way you sort of make this work is then you have this free parameter alpha that you then can use to maybe get some optimal bound for your purposes. The, again, reiterating this fact, the, with the triangle inequality, you get some sort of universal bound, right? If you have some p that you care about and you're applying some, hitting it with some q as a differential operator, you sort of get the worst case bound, right? You even get the worst case bound if Q had had, had complex roots and wasn't actually a real stability preserver. You're getting this sort of 
worst case bound on what happens. Here, you have this extra parameter that you can use to kind of uh, you know, adjust to get just the right bound you want given the queue you have. Okay, I'm not going to talk about exactly how you might do that in practice, but it ends up being that this result uh, is, is sort of, I mean, just from that and kind of this conceptual argument I'm giving, ends up being uh, an important way to, to generalize the triangle inequality. And also, it should be known that the, that the proof of this and, the, and you know, this type of bound is very specific to, to real rooted polynomials. There's, there's not really anything you can do in terms of complex roots that's anywhere near this. Okay, so it somehow more fully takes into account uh, the fact that we have all real roots. The question then that's, that's fairly natural at this point, if you know, you're looking to generalize this rather than use it for some specific result is, well, this is just another differential operator. We already said that that of convolution you know, characterizes such operators. And, and in particular, this is a you know, stability preserver. So there should be some convolution by some real rooted polynomial. And again, I think Mohan mentioned this. Uh, and it is. So for, some, you know, for your degree d and your alpha, you can make this polynomial u sub alpha, with I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to denote as a little u. Uh, and if you write it like this, then, then applying u alpha to a polynomial is the same as hitting it you know, with this convolution. Okay. And you also notice that the max root of this, right, the roots are d alpha and a bunch of zeros. Okay, so the max root is d alpha. And so you could rewrite this in a way that looks a little nicer. Um, that d alpha is sort of taken care of here. And these are all convolutions by u alpha. Okay. And then the next question is, well, why u alpha? And it turns out it's not necessary. Um, so you can take any three real rooted polynomials and you get a bound like this. Um, now, what's interesting about this, which I, I actually was just thinking about this earlier today, and I don't know exactly what this means, but Right, if you take R, that's not just one of those U alphas, you could similarly write down a statement like this about what this means. It'll just be like, you know, the operator will be something like 1 minus alpha dx minus something else dx squared minus something else dx cubed. And basically, you'll get a similar type of barrier bound, except the numerator will be some weird differential operator, right? It won't just be dxp. I don't know if there's any way to take, make use of that. Uh, by like doing some really like you know tedious calculations or picking some really really nice you know derivative that tells you some special information or something like this I don't know um, but but it, you know, maybe maybe it could do something I'm I'm not really sure though but I just just an aside there um, okay but in any case we get this and there are a number of interpretations of this um, one of them as Mohan pointed out is just submodularity okay uh, this is somehow Right, the traditional submodularity result that you would write down as a function on, on sets. Um, let's see if I'm going to. It says something like if you have some function on discrete sets, you would call it submodular if it has this property. Okay, so this is sort of emulating this whenever you're looking at maybe finite sets of polynomials and unioning them you do by taking additive convolution, right? So if your function was something like, you know, lambda 1 additive convolution over i of pi or something like this, right? and, and a set of pi's is your input, then maybe you would say something like uh, this is a submodular function on finite sets of real rooted polynomials. Um, another way to interpret submodularity, and these are all going to be kind of ways to think about submodularity, is a sort of diminishing returns property. Okay. Now, there's, there's something kind of conceptual that I'm just going to state here, uh, but uh, so a number of these properties sort of suggest it, maybe majorization being one of them. Um, the convolution has this feel of spreading out roots. Right? So we already saw that x to the n is the identity. And so if you convolve with x to the n, it doesn't do anything. And somehow x to the n's roots are, are packed together as much as they could be. They're all in one place. As soon as you start to spread out the roots of x to the n and convolve by that, it spreads out the root, uh, roots of the output more and more. So you want to think of convolving by a real rooted polynomial, again, when the input's real rooted, as spreading out the roots. Okay? And so what you can think then of, of this saying, this is just me rearranging this, is that if you start with some polynomial r, and you compare the difference in the max root between convolving with p and not, 
okay? That's some quantity. If instead, before I convolve by P, I first convolve by Q, so I, I spread the roots out of R more, then somehow further convolving by P or not, the difference is less. So somehow the more spread out the roots are, the less convolving by a polynomial P spreads the roots out further. Okay, and this, again, this is just, if you're familiar with submodularity, this is just another interpretation of it uh, in general. But uh, again, this is maybe more intuition for what, what, these, what these operators are doing to roots, and, and in turn, what all differential operators are doing to roots. Yes? Are you just saying the statement for the max root or all roots? Just for the max root, yes, that's correct. But uh, to be fair, uh, I guess then, right, so you get it for the max root by doing some negations, you get it for the min root, so it's really more like the bands are, I don't mean like somehow how clumped together they are, I just mean like the, the minimum band that contains all the roots, something like this. And it's not true for single interior roots. Yeah, if you just pick like the third root or something like that, you're, you're not going to get this type of statement. And again, this is just maybe me saying in words what I just said about this diminishing returns. Um, I, I wanted to say it multiple times because it took me a while to, to really internalize what was going on. And even, you know, by my long-winded description, maybe, maybe I still have some more, you know, learning to do. Um, but anyway, so these are a bunch of different ways to say the same sort of thing. Okay. And there's another uh, way you can kind of think about this, um, which I'm, I'm not going to say much about it, but uh, when I was originally looking around at properties like this, um, I sort of stumbled up upon this like, notion of a polymatroid, which now is very kind of around because of the relations to completely locked and cave, strongly locked and cave, Lorentzian polynomials, whatever word you want to use. Um, and the way you can see this is you, you use this sort of function, but you restrict yourself to polynomials whose roots sum to zero. Um, and when you do this, you, you get not only this property, the submodularity property, you also get that as the sets increase, so the sets of polynomials you're convolving, the max root increases. And so you need this extra like, um, you know, like increasing property of this function. Um, and then you get this sort of, like I said, non-discrete polymatroid. So people who are, know of this sort of thing, if you're interested in this or have comments or questions, I would like to talk about it. I'm, I, I'm just sort of saying this into the air in case people find it interesting. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So. Oh. Okay. Um, okay. So with that, then we have a, a bunch of conjectures, which I'll quickly state. Um, basically related to generalizing this thing right here, okay? Right, we had a triangle inequality. We were able to get horns inequalities. Now we have this like better triangle inequality, whatever you wanna, whatever you wanna call it. Can we do something similar with horns inequalities, okay? So if you have, right, these i, j, and k, which has this property that all Hermitian matrices have this sort of triangle inequality for those indices, can you also get this? Okay, and the first thing I'll note about this is the only thing that's sort of not obvious to write down here is, is whether or not this should be i or something different. And in fact, we have some maybe more tedious conjectures about how exactly what you can change this i to. But if you think about this, there's no way that this one, this one, and this one can be anything except something that comes from a Horn's inequality. Because what I could do is just let r be the identity for the additive convolution. This becomes a zero, the r goes away, the R goes away, the R goes away, and you're just left with horns inequalities. So definitely the, the, the first and the last two have to be something that comes from a horns triple. That second one, I'm not sure. This is the conjecture we have. We tested it uh, extensively, um, you know, as, as high degree as we could, uh, and we couldn't find a counterexample. Uh, but that said, the proof of the previous thing for the max root is very dependent upon the fact that we are only looking at the max root. Uh, and we have really no idea how to how to generalize this. I will make one comment. It probably can't follow from hyperbolicity, okay? Or at least, if it does follow from hyperbolicity, it's some special technique that I would, I would like to see, um, basically because of this problem. So even the thing we know to be true is not just as is true for matrices. Um, and, and again, for hyperbolic polynomials, the intuition is, um, you know, if it's, if it's gonna work through hyperbolicity, it better work for matrices. Um, and so since this doesn't just as is work for matrices, 
if hyperbolicity is going to help you, it's going to have to be in some interesting way. Maybe, you know, the fact that we have a lot of symmetry here, right? Somehow I can, I can permute all the A's or all the B's and, I, and it doesn't change. So maybe some symmetry properties will help you out. I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, but in any case, just a comment there. Uh, okay. Can, can you prove that, that your main inequality, which you have a proof? This? Yeah. Uh, can you prove it uh, by induction and the degree? Is it how you prove it? Um, by differentiation, by factoring uh, each of them. So there, there, there is some induction you can do, and the original proof of MSS does some induction where they sort of take two roots and kind of pinch them together and then and then like induct I think on the multi multiplicity like of the root there or something like this um, and there is some induction in the way you prove this um, because I think for the base case you get something really strong if say Q is is degree one or something like this you get you even get majorization it's really easy to prove actually you get just the full majorization inequalities it's just then there, there is some kind of induction after that, but again, it like really heavily relies on the fact that it's the mat, like we were looking at the fact that there's a place in the polynomial where it's zero. And that, that, that's like crucial to, to the rest of the proof. So it is some induction, it's just in the induction, it's pretty crucial that we're looking at one root. Okay, so I, I only have maybe a couple minutes, so I'll kind of talk about this quickly. Uh, it, it, you know, it's the least, it's the most unfortunate part of the talk because it's the thing we really wanted and it ended up being false, but I guess that's the way it is. Um, so I'll quickly just mention this. So this is what turns out to be the natural multivariate generalization. I'll quickly tell you what I mean by this. So lambda here is now an, a vector of positive integers. X is a vector of variables, okay? And this is somehow the degree vector for each variable. So we're looking at things that are not like homogenous or anything like that. They just have a max degree in each variable, okay? And now instead of D being the sort of com convolution parameter, we have lambda, which means now that I'm going to sum over all possible non-negative integer vectors that are in between, that are entry-wise in between zero and lambda. And I'm gonna do those derivatives on P. So if it's, you know, if it was two comma one comma zero, I would do two x one derivatives, one x two derivative, no x three derivatives. And then I'll just do the rest of the derivatives on Q. And one over lambda factorial, just a constant, it means one over product of lambda I factorial. <coughs> but it's just constant doesn't, doesn't really matter. Okay, so this is, turns out to be the natural generalization because basically you get everything you want. It preserves real stability. It characterizes differential operators on multivariate polynomials which preserve real stability. Um, and for a very similar reason, well, and, sorry, and real stability, if you haven't seen it, is just non-vanishing when inputs are in the upper half plane. Okay, this is, okay. Um, and uh, for very similar reasons to the, to the other case, uh, you get some kind of triangle inequality, which I'll, I'll talk about now. So, uh, and I maybe have like two minutes, so I'll quickly do this. This is this idea of points above the roots. Uh, the point is there aren't really roots of multivariate polynomials, so you need, instead you define kind of this convex set that's larger than any real root and you talk about um, set relations between those, those sets for different polynomials, okay? And in particular, you get something like this, which this, you know, this inequality sort of, you know, the sign goes the other way, but this is exactly what you would expect in the triangle inequality. In the case of univariate, right, this means that like the interval from the max root of this to infinity contains the sum of the intervals from the max root of these to infinity, which means that the sum of the max roots of these has to be larger than the max root of this. And uh, we have this conjecture, which I think I, I discussed with Mohan. I, I, I'm, I'm actually a little bit confused now. I, I think we figured it, I think we all figured it out, but I think actually this conjecture is still open. But the problem is it's not strong enough to prove the, the bounds that we really want. Okay, the thing that we really want is, it turns out this, which this is me just talking about how this, uh, this, kind of, uh, this is basically me talking about how this is equivalent, okay? And the point is, you want something a lot stronger, and the thing that makes this so much stronger is, you know barrier information in all directions, and then you want to be able to move sort of in all directions simultaneously. This is the Hadamard product of these vectors, 
okay? And sorry, I'm going pretty quick through this, but the point is this, is this is very strong to add in. And if you had this, it would kind of give you everything you'd ever wanted, okay? And it, and it, was, and it was perfect, right? It, it didn't give any counterexamples. It gave you just exactly what you would want. And it was, it, we, you know, this is it. This is the thing. This is what we're going to get. But of course, uh, you know, it's, it's wrong. So uh, we sort of, at some point, we were like, well, do we keep kind of hammering at this or do we just sort of write down what we have and kind of move on? Um, and we, we, you know, we hammered at it for a little while longer and, and sort of moved on. But uh, basically the idea is you take something that's on the boundary of real stable polynomials um, and that can kind of, you can use that to get a, a counterexample for this. That said, uh, all the polynomials we care about are determinantal. It's unclear if this counterexample is determinantal. It's unclear if it's still true. Uh, it's still false for determinantal. And in fact, most of our testing was random. And the best way to randomly generate a real stable polynomial is to take a determinant. And that was never false. So it's possible that maybe this is still true. Uh, I, but we don't, we don't know, we don't know how, how to go about that. Um, and then you can kind of ask very similar questions in the multivariate case, which is a much more open-ended thing. Um, and generally speaking, then, this is just sort of a summary of kind of what was left open after all of this stuff. So that, that, is, uh, that is it. You had one of the many conjectures uh, that was true when like i equals j equals k equals 1. Correct. Is it true if i equals j equals k equals, you know, an interval? Uh, like, like the majorization type things? Unknown. I mean, all, all of them are unknown except for the max root. It's just that, you know, we tested them a bunch and couldn't find it, a counterexample. Um, so, yeah. Even we, we hacked away at equals 1 and 2 for a while and that didn't even work, really. So. It's, it, something new needs to happen if this is going to be proved. Yeah, the, there's only one way to prove the original result that we're aware of, and it verifies, as John was referencing, it verifies max root by just testing zeroness at one point, or proving zeroness at one point. So it's really hard to see how that method would give you any information about sums of roots, because that's, that's the way it verifies root information, or root position. So really, I think fundamentally, we need a, a new proof of the, the original result to get these. But I think that's the most interesting, the, the sums of the top rooms. <laughs>